We used to have a saying in the army then, that when a bullet talks, a mouth doesn't talk. In the army, they call you the assassin. Yes. Uh, assassin meaning killer, right? Yes. Same I love and say what? Do swear that. Do swear that. I'll speak the truth. I will speak the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Nothing but the truth. Uh, Welcome to the TRRC. We have met previously. We are calling you mainly to testify about a few discrete issues. You have been implicated. You have been mentioned as someone who participated in the beating of soldiers who were arrested during November 11. Uh, you were also alleged to have participated in the torture of Sana Sabali and Sadibu Haidara and in the torture of members of the entourage who were arrested in January of 1995. Do you understand? Very well, Council. Good. So let us start now. Kindly give us your full names, please. My names are Lamin Senghor. Are you known by any other names? I have a nickname those days in the army. My home name is Pa. In the army, I used to be called the assassin. Uh, so, uh, your name at home, nickname at home, is Pa Senghor. Yes. But in the army, they call you the assassin. Yes. Uh, assassin meaning killer, right? Yes. Uh, kindly tell us uh, your date of birth, please. I was born on the 17th of June, 1973. Where about? I was born in Bakau. Where did you go to school? I was part of the force batch of Bakau Newton Primary School, but we were housed in Bakau Primary because then there was the school complex was not ready. So in 1985, we were moved to where the present school is, but the same year I was transferred again to Albion Primary School where I sat my common entrance. Uh, you thereafter went to St. Augustine Secondary, secondary school, school, correct? Yes, correct. Uh, and uh, you finished your secondary school in 1991? That's correct. All right. So when did you join the army? I joined the army in the same year, 1991. When did you finish your training? It took almost six months because the training was supposed to be around four months, some weeks. But by in our last two weeks, uh, the, the British then made an assessment, that is the final exams. Then they realized that most of the batch failed, so, and they cannot afford to release all of us and select a new batch. So we decided to back squad us, that is, taking us back to the first two weeks of the training. Ultimately, you finished the training in 1991? Yes. And uh, in which company uh, were you assigned to? I was assigned at Yundum Barracks. The company then was Echo Company. And who were your commanders? Then I found Sub Lieutenant So, Sub Lieutenant Edward Singate. The company sergeant major was Jibril Say, late now and the company commander was Momo Dubaji. Uh, do you recall where you were uh, in July 22nd, or July 21st, uh, 1994? Yes, I was at the barracks. Kindly tell us what happened there. I was part of a platoon to be headed by Sana Savali, who were to reinforce the soldiers at the airport who went on guard of honor. Yes, proceed please. So while we were there, we received a call that for us to stand down. So I automatically slept. 
until when the soldiers were returning from the barracks because of the, their noise and shouting, I wake up again. Then they, we were falling, the whole battalion, everybody was falling. And we were asked to go home. Tomorrow morning, the battalion commander want to see us. That is battalion master parade without arms. So that rang a bell in me. What were you supposed to do in that parade? The guard of honor at the airport. So in case there was an attack, their intention, so in case it was fulfilled, we were to reinforce them. Reinforce who? Those who went on guard of honor. What were they to do during that guard of honor? That was the day they planned the coup, 21st. So when it failed, and going by what we were told to fall in the following day without arms, that rang a bell to all of us. And uh, what, by that you suggesting that it sent a statement, it sent a message to all of you. And what was that message? How I understood it was maybe we will be arrested the following day. They have their list. Without arms, meaning some people will be more stronger than us who are not armed. So there and then they can go by their arrest through the list they have. So after that meeting, that parade, you suspected that on the next day, some of you would be arrested? That's correct. And who gave you that information? The, the boys told us. In fact, the RSM announced the parade, RSM-5, that the battalion the commander want to see us, the Nigerian, Colonel Odu. But your team, you were under Sana Sabali, which was a reserve team to go and reinforce those who were at the airport should, should they, or in the event that they started the coup. That's correct. But you received information to stand down. That's correct. Okay. So what happened after you were asked to go home? Uh, that afternoon, that, that period and the morning, what happened? Before we left the barracks, word was being circulated that Edward Singate asked us to come back by midnight. Those days he was my platoon commander. So I personally went to him and told him that, well, for me I cannot come back because I was penniless at that time. I have to pay double fares from Yundum to Sarakuna, Sarakuna to Bakau, so I can't make it at that time of the night. So he gave me a twenty-five dollars each. Those days, that one way will be five dollars, two dollars, three dollars from Yundum to Sarakuna, two dollars from Sarakuna to Bakau. So meaning, he can only spare me ten dollars out of that twenty-five and make strong emphasis that I shall return his change the following day. That is the fifteen dollars. He was that broke. Not that. We were very poor then. Imagine an officer, if an officer can emphasize on it $15. How about people like me, a private soldier? Did you eventually uh, go to the barracks? Yes, I took the money, went home, put a civilian dress in my bag so in case things fall apart. Even my mom was suspicious. He told me that this has never happened. I said, yes, we are on a standby. So I went to the barracks. People start coming. What time did you go to the After barracks? After midnight. So it's there I came to learn that the late al Mane have duplicated the old Amuriki. That is, the weapons that are no more use, they pack them separately from the new ones and the heavy ones. So when he opened that armory, we arm ourselves with all rifles. Ammunition boxes were removed, so everybody feed your magazine, waiting for time. So early in the morning, there was no driver to be seen, and all the trucks, like it was like they steered the steering wheel till it ends, then they locked the steering wheel, so nobody can drive those trucks. 
So we went outside on the highway, hijacked two trucks and brought them to the barracks. I remember it was even driven by a mechanic. So when I boarded the truck, the second truck, it was two trucks. One is to go to Fajara barracks, the other one is to go to Banyol. So Edward Singate came and told me to come down from the truck. He showed me a pickup and said I should load that pickup with reserve ammunition so in case there is contact, we will still have ammunition. What time are you talking about? This will be around 8, 9. The at this stage, did any officers arrive at the barracks? Well, I can only remember the council members. Apart from the council members, did any officer arrive at the barracks? An officer who yes. was not a member of, yes. of the coupist? Yes. Can you tell us about it? This was in an earlier time, just after six to seven. The adjutant came, city of Gomez. He used to come very early to work. So when he came, Edward halted him and asked him not to move. So the adjutant stood. Which Edward are you referring Edward Singate. to? Please proceed. So. When Edward requested for the new armory key, the adjutant told him over his dead body. So Edward used like pointing a, thing, a pistol. Normally a rifle will be fired with two hands. But this time around, Edward used one hand to fire that AK. The bullet fell in between the legs of Sirif Gomez. When Sirif bent down, he saw the dust. We used to have a saying, when a bullet talks, mouth don't talk. Could you say that again? We used to have a saying in the army then, that when a bullet talks, a mouth doesn't talk. So the moment Sirif saw the dust in between the legs, he just put his hand inside and threw the new Amoriki, and we were like jubilant. Because we know there is no force in Gambia that can stop us now. Where were you jubilant? Sorry? Why were you jubilant? Because we know that we will now access these new weapons, including heavy weapons, rocket propelled grenade. So when we handle this, there is no force in Gambia that can stop us. So and uh, now that you have received the armory keys, what did you do? Everybody went in for your personal weapon. And tell us what happened after that? I went in for my machine gun because I was a gunner. So, the, uh, what do you mean by a machine gun? Can you tell us about this type of weapon? These are these weapons are designed to give firepower to any engaging soldiers, be it from the section level, platoon level, company level, or even battalion level, because it fires rapidly. You have what you call GPMG, General Purpose Machine Gun, which I was handling. And uh, this uh, machine gun, what is the weight? Well, I can estimate it to be like maybe seven kgs. Seven kilograms. Okay. Uh, and uh, what kind of uh, bullets does it use? It uses a bigger caliber. And uh, the magazine? No, oh, this doesn't use a magazine. It uses drums. You call it drums. Uh, and uh, how heavy is this drum? Maybe 1.5, maybe. So the drum plus the machine gun would be about 8 kilograms. Okay. So also, sorry, this weapon is designed for the use of two people. You have the loader and the firer. But this that, that, that is when it is actually being operated? Yes, that is how it is made. It is to be used by two people, um, a loader uh, and a firearm. And fire can up. you give us, uh, can you explain what would be the responsibilities of the two people, the individual responsibilities One of the two people? One will be firing the weapon, 
while the other one will be loading for him because it is in a belt form, the ammunition. So if it is not controlled, it can jam in the chamber. So this one has to be controlling the, the belt so that the belt will be entering the cartridge, uh, cartridge smoothly while the fire is firing. But even at that, one person can still operate it yes. by using one arm to control the belt. Yes. So the need for another person uh, to support would just be to change the uh, to change the belt when one belt finishes to load it pretty much. Not actually. Mostly the fire will do that. The loader's responsibility is only to make sure the belt enters the chamber smoothly. And if the fire can't do that, uh, the need for another person wouldn't be, wouldn't be there. It's very minimal. Very minimal. And certainly it's not just to carry, because uh, it's about eight kilos yes. at most. All right. So this is the weapon that you took. Yes. All right. And tell us what happened after that. What happened after that, when, when I boarded the truck and I was asked to come down by Edward Singate, he instructed me to load a pickup with reserve ammunition so in case of contact. So they left the barracks before me. So when I reached the Denton Bridge at the KMCN of the bridge, I found soldiers on the prone position. So I couldn't understand why. So the first person I met, I asked him, what is going on? He said the other side of the bridge, that is the Banjul N, is occupied by the Zandam commandos. And they said that if anybody attempts to cross the bridge, they will fire you. So I then asked the boy, so now what? He, told, he was even annoyed. He wanted to shout on me, or he was annoyed about my inquiries. He told me, boy, hey, we are working on orders. If they didn't give the order, how can we go? So I just took my machine gun, start moving. So to, towards where? Towards Banjul. So I move at a certain level. I turn, I turn back and so now soldiers have start getting up. So the Zandams were threatening us. If you move, we fire. I said, fire. If you fail, I fire. So they were entering the, the river till around knee level. Maybe they know they cannot continue going, so they surrendered. So you're suggesting that you went kamikaze along the road towards Banjul, and uh, you threatened the Zandarmuri with your machine gun. No, they threatened me to stop. If they, if I don't stop, they will fire. And you responded that if they do they, not succeed, they can fire. If they fail, I will fire also. And uh, ultimately, they surrendered. Yes. That is your testimony. Yes. And and that is how uh, you guys had access to the bridge. Yes. That is what you are telling the commission. Yes. Mr. Witness, we've had completely different testimony. The testimony is that Yaya Jame negotiated with uh, Armiyao, uh, that was uh, Captain Suare, and Captain Suare asked his men to surrender and join the coupist. No mention of Lamin Senghor acting kamikaze, lone soldier getting is under Murray to surrender. What do you say to that? I still maintain my statement, Council. That it was your show of bravery and brandishing a machine gun which led the Zandar Murray to surrender? That's what you're telling us? Yes, the, the part the side I was I was on. Because I was around the swampy area. Uh, uh, but 
Do you recall giving us a statement? Which you, in fact, signed this morning? Yes. Uh, let me send it back to you to take a look at. Is that the statement? Yes, this is my statement. That's the statement you signed? Yes. This morning? Yes. Go through the pages and satisfy yourself that this is, in fact, a document? That's the that's this statement, correct? Yes. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, at the end of uh, his testimony, we would ask to put in the, the statement as part of the record. We would give you the exhibit number if you so agree to add it into the record. Uh, agreed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, may, I, may I draw your attention to paragraph four, please? Of, of the statement? Yes. Uh, and uh, I will just read out the relevant excerpt very quickly. Um, uh, you said somewhere in the middle of uh, paragraph four, that is page five of the statement, and I read the sentence starting with uh, then we departed, Bef then, no, they then departed before I finished loading the pickup. It's in the middle of the page. Can you see it? Yes. And uh, you went on to say as follows, and I quote, they then departed before I finished loading the pickup and I later caught up with them at the combo side of Denton Bridge. Full stop. That's correct, isn't it? Yes. That's what you told the investigators? Yes. Then it went on to say, I asked the one soldier who I cannot recall about what was happening, and he told me that the gendarmerie commanders were on the other side of the bridge and wouldn't allow them to cross. After some negotiations between our leaders and the leaders of the gendarmerie, we finally crossed the bridge and we are also joined by the gendarmerie, unquote. That's your statement, isn't it? Yes. So this story about assassin walking down, walking along the road, lone soldier brandishing a machine gun, telling those soldiers that, if you don't shoot, if you shoot and don't succeed, I will shoot. And that led them to surrender is in fact not true. Yes. Why are you telling us that story? Knowing fully well it's not true. Could you give back the statement, please? I again warn you uh, that this is not a circus. Uh, you have to be truthful. If you're not truthful, you could land yourself in trouble. Um, so continue with your story. What happened after you crossed the bridge? We headed to Banjul and arrived at the grave, the Christian cemetery. We found another batch of Zandams. This time around, it was headed by Alaji Martin. So it was very easy for Lieutenant Jame to convince Alaji Martin. Then Alaji Martin instructed his men to, to surrender. Proceed, please. Then the group was divided into two one headed by Lieutenant Jamme, and they used the Marina Parade Road. 
the other group was headed by Edward Singate. That took the independence drive. So I was part of that group. Then we went through the market highway to the main gate of the state house. What happened after that? After what happened was we took cover because all gates were closed. Then a soldier, I think then he was a staff sergeant back at the camera. He came out and asked us what our problem was. So I was trying to threaten him, but it doesn't work. Then later Musa Jame came and said he's having a key to the small door. Then it was open. That's the door we used and enter. Then we meet up with Yaya Jame's group also, who entered through the back gate around the guardroom. That effectively sealed the fate of the PPP government, didn't it? Yes. Uh, after the success of the July 22nd coup, where were you posted? I was at, at the State Guards. Where was the State Guards based? In the State House. And who was your immediate commander? I think, if I have it right, it was one Lieutenant Mende. Papo, they call him Papo, if I could recall. He was the first State Guard commander after the takeover. By November 1994, where were you based? At the State House. Do you recall the events of uh, November 11, 1994? Yes. Before we get to that, Let me take your mind back a little bit to July 22nd. From the bridge, how did you manage to reach State House in Banjo? By foot, we walked it. You walked all the way, carrying your machine gun? Yes. Uh, how many drums did you carry? I removed all and Arrange the belt and place it in my haversack. Rambo style, correct? That was Rambo style, correct? You have the belt over your neck and your shoulder, as depicted in Rambo movies, correct? Correct. And in fact, that is a way of reducing the weight, isn't it? Yes. And that's the way you would normally do it? Yes. It's in fact a little more frightening to your opponents, isn't it? No, it can also help me not to use the loader. The loader can do something else. So that makes it easy for one person to operate this machine gun. Yes. It's convenient. It's, it reduces the weight. So because of that, you were able to walk from... Where did the vehicle drop you off in, November, in July 22nd? Just before before where I found those soldiers. Which would be Carmelo or Denton Bridge? No, it's Denton Bridge. Okay. So you walked all the way to State House? Yes. Good. So now let's take you to November 11. Uh, kindly tell us what happened from November 10, 1994 onwards. Prior to November 10th, there were rumors circulating that soldiers from officers from Fajara Barracks and Yundum are planning to counter the junta. How did you get that information? I personally talked to my class. He was a cadet officer then, cadet Amadou Sela. So during greetings, he told me in Manika Albijel and Kai Koyesa. So that was how myself confirmed that the rumor I was hearing was true. Can you translate for us what he said? Tran interpret you, what he you said. You people are there. I said yes. He said okay. Wait for us there. We'll come for you. Did you have? Did you discuss what he meant by that? No, I understood it because prior 
to prior to talking to him, rumors were circulating. Rumors of coup. Yes, of a counter. So, so from what he said, you believe he was referring to a counter coup that they were organizing. That's what you believed. Most importantly, after he told me this, all heavy weapons that were mounted on defensive positions, the ammunition were changed. If you make ready a weapon, normally the rounds will base in the chamber. But this time around, if you make the weapon ready, the round will be extracted out immediately because of it is a smaller caliber to that particular weapon. So there is when all of us believe that, yeah, this was true. And uh, what happened after that? What happened after, after you that? realized that uh, the ammunition were being changed? The situation was addressed and it, the proper ammunition were brought in again. So tell us about November 11, what happened that night? The council members came by between after 8 towards midnight. Where did they come? From their individual homes. To where? To the State House. Can you tell us which council members came? Edward Singate, Sana Sabali, Sadibu Haidara, and Yanko Bature. Did they come alone? They came with their uh, orderlies. Do you know any of them? Most of them. Can you tell us who they were? For the orderlies of Sana Sabali, I can remember JCB. Full name, please. John C. B. Mende. Karen? I can remember so, but the first name I, I, I cannot know. Can so remember. was with who? So was with uh, Sadibu. Please proceed. I can remember Seko Jasi. He was also with Sadibu. I can remember Mustafa Toure, nicknamed Churo. With who? Nicknamed Churo. With who? I am correct, I think Mustafa was with Sadibu also. Proceed. So when they came... And uh, how about Sana Sabali? Sana, I think Alfosenu Suso was with him. J JCB. Yeah, this I can recall. Do you know where the uh, Njai? Njai, yes, Njai. Which Njai? Njai Ponkal. Any other Njai with him? There used to be another Njai Baba, Baba Njai, if I am correct. And uh, how about for Edward Singate? It was, there was this Bakari Jiba. Baj Samba, Baj as Samba, Baj Samba Jalo, as a driver. Uh, one Fiat Colored Sergeant from SO, Fati, Sergeant Fati. And uh, what was his first name? Damin Fati. Then you have Marena, the first name I forgot, short guy. And for Yanko Bature? What today? Esa was with him. Esa who? Esa Mendy. Esa or Ensa? Ensa. Good. Uh, and I, I think one Jalimusaso also. Okay, essentially those were the people. Did they come with any other people apart from this group? No, each came with his own orderly. And. Uh, Tell us what happened when they arrived at State House. They went upstairs, discussed with the chairman, then they came back and a fallen was called. Who was the chair? Who are you referring to as the chairman? Lieutenant Yaya Jami. Then when a fallen was called, we all assembled and Edward said that they need volunteers. 
because according to the rumor that was going, these people are planning to attack. So before we wait to be attacked, let's take the attack to them. So he asked for volunteers, then a number of people came out, including me. How many came out? I can estimate almost a platoon. Which is how many? 40, men? 40 something men. That is a platoon is not 40 something men. This. A platoon would be about 30 men. Correct? It will be. So 40 something men would be a bit of an exaggeration, wouldn't it? No. I'm not exaggerating. Okay, so your estimate is That's that estimate. there were about 40 something men. Correct. Uh, does this group include the council members and their orderlies? So, these 40 something men, where did they come from? They are all state guards. So all the state guards volunteered? Yes. Because according to the rumor, we were to be attacked by both Fajara Barracks and Yunum Barracks. So obviously, these two Barracks members cannot be present at the State House at that time. So you and your colleagues volunteered? Yes. So what happened after you all fell in and decided to volunteer? What happened? We were... We moved towards Yundum Barracks via Banjolonde. And uh, did you at any point in time take weapons? Yes, I was with my personal weapon. And uh, tell us how that happened, how people got armed? Everybody is with your arm. Nobody shares weapon with another. So whereas if the weapon is not with you, it will be in the armory. And you are the only person who is authorized to sign out that particular weapon because it's your personal weapon. On this particular occasion, did you sign out weapons? My GPMG. Could you say again? My GPMG. Uh, did you guys have to sign out weapons at this, on, for this particular occasion? No. I particularly don't need to sign out because I'm always with my weapon. Could you explain what you mean by that? I mean, I particularly, on that particular day, I don't need to sign out a weapon because I'm, I was already with my weapon. From when? From the armory. When did you take that weapon from the armory? This was well before the council members came. Give me, tell us what time. Like I said, the council members came by between 8 onwards. But this weapon was with me throughout the day. Throughout the day, you yes. carried this weapon? It was with me. If it is not used actively, I will put it under the mattress in the guard room. Like if I want to go somewhere. It's, it's not such a big weapon. It is a weapon you can put under the mattress. It's a big weapon. But how can, it, how can you put it under the mattress? Yes, it's possible. Anybody who doesn't want to go out with your weapon, you normally put it especially on the bed that you slept on. It will be under the mattress. Uh, show us by demonstration, show of hands. The, the length will be like this. So obviously this can, you can just raise the, the mattress and put it under. Even though if somebody is passing can know that there is a weapon, especially of that caliber. So it, did it have a tripod or it didn't? It, it, did you have the tripod mounted or you didn't? No. So you just carried it like can, a normal it, gun? It is, it is bendable. You can bend it. If you want to use it, you have to open it. Uh, normally, how would you fire such a weapon? In the prone position. The what? In the prone position. What is that? Indicators? Lying, lying down, normally. So, so that's the only way you, that's the way you no, normally... No, that's not the only way. You can fire, fire it on the, on the move also. And it's not a problem firing it on the move? Yes, because it's, it's very heavy. You need to be very strong to fire it on the move. Yes, but you've already told us it's 
with the magazine and all, with the bullets and all, it weighs about eight kilos. So eight kilos, even a child can carry eight kilos. So for you, on that particular occasion, how were you firing your weapon? On the move. On the move. It wasn't a problem? No. Good. So on that day, your testimony is that the soldiers already had their weapons anyway. So there was no issuance of weapons. Some, some might be issued, but not to my knowledge anyway. As far as you know, were any new weapons issued to the group on that day? Yes, I've seen new weapons, especially with the Otlis. But, but these new weapons were not di distributed to your group? Well before now. That is your testimony? Yes, I've seen. I've seen new weapons, but not with me mostly with the Otlis. That was the first time I've seen the weapons that you want to ask. And what were those type of weapons? They are PGL. What is PGL? Portable grenade launchers. Of... Is it's it an, it's an AK. It is also an AK-47. But the, this thing was attached on the weapon, so it can launch a grenade. Portable grenade launcher. But it's an AK. But for you, you carried your favorite machine gun. Yes. Good. And uh, tell us uh, how you how you were deployed from uh, State House to wherever you were going. With the means of vehicles. Yes. We moved towards Yundum Barracks via Banjolonde. How many vehicles? This will be six to seven vehicles because all the council members were in their vehicles. And that would be four vehicles, For the right? Members. Uh, plus two, three other vehicles for the rest of the soldiers. Yes. Right. Okay. So tell us, uh, who led the group? It was led by Sana Sabali, being the senior man. So tell us what happened from the point you left State House. We left State House via Banjolondi up to a certain point. We stopped. This was like the former president's garden, Jawara, a defense of that garden. So while we were making plans, we saw a darkness coming. So a soldier straight, straightened his leg. That soldier who was coming kicked the leg of this soldier and fell down. So he was kept on the ground. Then. He was the one who told us that they are preparing in the barracks and he don't want to be part of it. So he was released to go. And I was instructed by Edward, me and another soldier called Yuno Sabari, to go and make a recce in the barracks. What do you mean by to make a recce in the barracks? To simpl simplify it, surveillance. The recognition mission exactly. to the barracks. Yeah. Uh, that is to go and check what is happening what is in happening the barracks there. and come and report back. Yes. That's right. Did you go at all? Yes, we went. On our way, we saw that similar darkness. You know, in the darkness, if you see an object, especially a human being, you will know that there is something there. So we saw another one. I and you know somebody took cover. We applied the same method, and we got that soldier also on the ground. This soldier became somebody I knew very well because he calls me uncle because the mom is the same tribe with me. And he told me that he also is also going away because he don't want to be part of what is happening in the barracks. So I advise him not to take the road leading to the right because taking the right will take you to Banjulunding and he might fall in the trap of the council members. So I advise him to take the road on the left and he escaped. Then we came back, we saw movements in the barracks, we came back and gave that situation report. So I even recommend to use the back gate going to the primary school. And then what happened after that? 
and we all advance towards that location and enter through the back gate going to the primary school. As we read the first Sangha, that is the defensive poison, the soldier was caught on surprise because the moment he saw Edward and his color, he cannot react. So he was disarmed with the, together with those we found there. Then we replaced the sentries with our own personnel, that is the people that came from State House. That's the method we use and disarm everybody within the barracks and place in our own sentries. Then all these sentries who were arrested because we didn't trust, so we just, you know, put all of them in the cells. And what happened after that? What time, in <coughs> fact, what time did you arrive at the barracks? This will be maybe shortly after midnight. Okay, so what happened after the sentries were arrested, uh, chained, and the arrested sentries put in the cells? What happened after that? The lights in the barracks were put on off, and we waited. For some time, you know, when going to the barracks, either coming from Birkama or Combo N, you have to go in either left or right. If you are coming from Birkama, you enter through the left. Coming from the Combo N, you enter through the right. So the moment we saw lights, we automatically knew that there is a vehicle coming. So everybody took poison. This was a blue Pajero. I was inside the, around the guard room area. So the moment the person arrived, he allied the vehicle and said, gentlemen, are you ready for my operation? So Sana Sabali responded, that sharp, small voice, yes, we are only waiting for you. The guy froze, he cannot even act, of course. He didn't. Who was this guy? This was Lieutenant Basiguru Baro. Baro came with orders, but I cannot remember. He was not alone in his vehicle. But they were all arrested at the spot and parked in the cells. So this time around, I went to Beaten or not beaten? No. They were just arrested because that time things were not settled yet. Then this time around, the second vehicle, when it was coming, I was already outside the barracks, but not far from the gate, when we saw the lights again. So everybody took cover. But when this vehicle came, the second one, they knew it earlier because outside the street lights were on. So things can be easily visible, unlike inside the barracks is dark. So I saw Dotfal, sorry, Sergeant Elef Jame was the first person to open the gate roll and took a, a firing poison and he opened fire. So that's where everything got loose. So I saw him running, including Lamin Jaju and Sajakal Sajan Juf. So while people were concentrating on these people escaping, in fact they are not even concentrating, they were firing at them. Did you fire? No, I didn't fire a single shot in Yundum Barracks. Okay. So because of this, it helped me to detect somebody. He came together with that vehicle, and he, almost, he was almost gone. Hadn't been, the boots were not outside, I wouldn't have seen him. Where exactly did you see him? This was on the highway. There was a nim tree that was cut, but it have started bringing new leaves. So the guy took cover in these leaves. So when I saw the boots, I knew that this is a soldier and it's not safe for me to go in front of him. He might be armed. I presume he might be armed. So I came through his legs, follow his body with, my, with the muscle of my weapon up to his head. I just touched the head, then he turned around. When he turned, I recognized him and I was even surprised. I told him, class, what are you doing here? For a clerk, you shouldn't be on operations. But I turned my back to see whether people were watching at me. I know that, yes, they have seen what I was seeing. Because the moment I make the action, people concentrate on me. And who was this person? This was A.J. Dabo, Abdullah J. Dabo. 
I regret that up to today because if they didn't see me, I would have let him go because he's my bad mate. Take this story again. Tell us what happened after Elif and Jaju ran away. How did you detect I, Abdullah I, AJJ Dabo? I saw combat boots. I saw a combat boots and I know that this must be a soldier. Where did you see the combat boots? The combat boots was obvious, but the body was already inside that bushy tree. So you're saying that he was hiding in the shrubs? That's yes. what you're saying? Yes. But and that his fully... boots were visible from no. where you were standing? Yes. And then what did you do? So when I, I know that there is nothing can be done, no, from the moment you saw the boots, you did not see the body, but you saw the boots. Yes. What did you do? I came through his back, follow from his boots going to his upper body. When I reached the head, I touched the head with my muscle, with the muscle of my weapon. So he turned around. That's the time I recognized him. And you recognized him as who? AJ Dabo. And what did you say to him? That, what are you doing here? You are a clerk, you shouldn't be on operations. But it was like, it was late for, for, for me. It was an unfortunate situation anyway. So you arrested him? I arrested him. And you handed him over? Correct. And what happened to him when you handed him over? He was also detained where the rest were. Did they beat him? Not in my presence. Nothing happened to him? At that moment. At that moment? Yes. Until he was handed over? Until he was taken to the cells, yes. nothing happened to him. Nothing happened. He was your class. You wanted to save him, but you know that others were there. They saw you and him. That's your testimony. Yes. Mr. Chairman, it is five minutes to the first break.